Hi, this is Victoria Naule, and here with me again is Professor Peter Cameron and Brandon Mallon. Uh, this is our last video, and we're going to talk about the limitations and challenges to international arbitration and what should be the way forward. But before we start, I'd like Professor Cameron and Brandon to briefly introduce themselves again. Professor Cameron. Hello, uh, Peter Cameron, Professor of International Energy Law here at the University of Dundee and uh, uh, the head of the uh, Energy Centre. Uh, I'm also sitting as an arbitrator and uh, I'm happy to be a, a co-director of the International Centre for Energy Arbitration with uh, my colleague uh, Brandon Malone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Brandon. Yes, I'm Brandon Malone. I'm a lawyer and international arbitrator based in Edinburgh and London. Uh, I chair the board of the Scottish Arbitration Centre uh, and as Peter says I'm a co-director with him in the International Centre for Energy Arbitration. Uh, thank you very much for the introductions. So in our previous videos you've taken us through um, an introduction to international arbitration, the set of arbitration, why is it important. We've also talked about what consider when choosing an arbitral tribunal and also the current cases in energy in the energy sector. So in our last video, we want to explore more on the limitations and challenges to international arbitration. What are the current limitations or challenges to international arbitration? Well, if you want me to kick off, uh, Victoria, I, I would say that, that, that what we've heard over several years now has, has been a growing uh, disgruntlement uh, on, the, on the side of many parties, but particularly um, particularly states about the way that the, the, the current system uh, works. Um, and I think we've moved into a second stage now that really states are, are taking action to um, uh, amend the, 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 the current regime to adapt it or reform it. Um, it's, it's not really a system in the way that say the, the WTO is a regime is a, is a system. It's, it's quite a, a decentered system and therefore reform is taking place in a, in a, in a rather uh, decentered and, 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 and sometimes haphazard way, way, haphazard in appearance anyway. Um, what we're seeing are more and more bilateral investment treaties uh, uh, being renegotiated. Uh, some as they come to an end, they don't go on in most cases forever and ever. So the provisions are being, are being renegotiated. Some of the multilateral treaties are being reviewed. Most recently you've had the, 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 the NAFTA treaty which has been um, replaced by a new treaty entirely that has quite different provisions on, on investment uh, arbitration. And the Energy Charter Treaty that I mentioned in one of our earlier talks, um, that's now going through what's called a modernization process. So you've got a, a, a shift or an, a, a review of, of, of a number of treaties that is leading to changes in the kind of protections that investors get, largely because a number of states have felt that their right to regulate has been somewhat chilled uh, by by the, uh, the provisions in the, in the, the earlier generation uh, of, of treaties. So there's a lot going on that requires um, council or lawyers um, to keep an eye on what, what the latest developments are since some of these changes can be implemented with great speed. So once states have, have made an agreement to change the, the provisions, um, you can find that you've got a, a very different treaty uh, in operation um, or, or an existing treaty has just been, has been terminated. So I think increasingly one has to keep an eye on the ball because it's a, it's a rapidly moving situation. So on the one hand you've got the, uh, what you might call the academic debate, although that involves mostly uh, practitioners and, and a certain number of academics. And on the other hand, you've got actions being taken uh, by a number, a, a number of states to really reform um, the system. All right, uh, Brendan, do you want to add more on the challenges? Yes, well, I mean, I, I, I agree with Peter, as I, as I always try to do, Peter. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a, a serious issue um, and, and, and a fast-moving one. It will be interesting to see how that tension works itself out, because, of course, what is being proposed is investment courts and 
Um, but as we have said in other films today, uh, the preference for clients is, is international arbitration because of the advantages they see within it. So um, states may well feel there's been a, a chilling effect on their ability to control things and to regulate. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the imposition of this regime will have a chilling effect on investment. Um, so we'll see. I mean, the client preferences for international arbitration. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, another thing uh, looking at challenges uh, under technology. It's an area of interest uh, to me. And, and really there's two, two big heads of uh, title under that theme. Uh, the first being threats presented by cyber attacks to the integrity of the arbitration system and the integrity of many systems around the world. Uh, but we're trying to address that uh, by the, the, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration together with New York City Bar uh, and the CPR Institute uh, have put together a, a, a draft uh, set of guidelines, a protocol on how to address the issues of cybersecurity within international arbitration. Uh, and that's a working group that I'm chairing and we hope to have a final product on that for uh, distribution a little later this year and we hope there'll be good take up of that. There's been a lot of feedback on our initial draft. Uh, and the other big challenge to what we do, uh, what's an opportunity and a challenge, is artificial intelligence and how, what effect that's going to have on the system of arbitration. Uh, arbitration uh, artificial intelligence is developing all the time. Uh, we already see systems that can predict uh, the outcome of a case, particularly if it's one where it's purely uh, based on paper, more difficult for them to assess witness credibility, obviously. Um, so we will soon, uh, and certainly, for example, in discovery, we talked about a massive task, but artificial intelligence systems able to do that fairly rapidly. So undoubtedly, people are going to lose their jobs as they are replaced, as technology has done forever and will continue to do forever, no doubt. Um, the question is, will, are we ever going to get to a stage where parties are going to accept the decision of an AI system in an arbitration? And that's, that's arguably where the system falls down. Now we'll see, uh, and as technology progresses and norms alter over time, it may well be that certainly for lower value things, uh, people are quite happy to accept a computerized award because it's quick instantaneous probably uh, and cheap uh, but for your higher value claims where it's the destiny of your company your livelihood on the line are you going to be willing to accept the computerized decision of an artificial intelligence arbitral panel or actually uh, do you want to be able to argue your case in front of someone you trust uh, and there's a inter very interesting tension there I suspect that uh, in, the, in the medium term these uh, computer generated awards will be used uh, as like an early neutral evaluation so that parties can look at what an AI system has come up with and then either arbitrate or mediate perhaps in light of that input rather than simply accepting it. But we'll see how that develops all the time. But that's a massively challenging uh, situation for the arbitration community um, and we'll just have to see where it, where it goes. All right, uh, in addition is Professor Kamara? No, oh, I, 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 I think uh, what I, I think uh, Brandon has sketched out a slightly scary future that, that made me think of driverless trains where you, uh, people like to see the driver there even if, the, if it's a, a computer that's, that's driving the train. Um, so I, I probably would add one more and that would probably be climate change litigation. I think in that, that area where it really is evolving, we're, we're not there yet, but it's clear that something big is beginning to develop. Maybe the legal side of it's not, not too clear yet, but um, as, as climate change begins to, to take an, a, a, what, what seems to be making an impact, um, you could find you're dealing with, with natural disasters on a, on a remarkable scale that we've just never seen before. Um, and, and some countries who, which, which experience high uh, water levels that are rising um, and changes of temperature. 
and they may very well decide that, that, that they should take action against companies that perhaps haven't done anything and ought to have done something um, in the past uh, on, a, on a, a model of, say, asbestos or, or tobacco uh, um, uh, litigation. We're not there yet, um, but it's interesting to see how companies increasingly are, are modifying the, the information that they're providing to shareholders uh, with a view to, to um, alerting them to, to, to the risks that, 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 or potential risks that, that lie ahead in, um, in, in future years. So. All right, thank you very much. And uh, the last question is, what should be the way forward with international arbitration? Well, that's a very big question, my goodness. <laughs> no, uh, because we've, uh, <laughs> we've discussed the challenges, so what are the solutions or what should be the way forward to ensure that uh, international arbitration continues to be success successful? Well, uh, it's... What is the future of international arbitration? The future, I think, I think it, it continues to grow uh, and I think it has a, a healthy future despite mm. all of these challenges. There are uh, growth areas. Uh, uh, Peter's mentioned climate change, for example. Mm. Um, a lot of work is being done on that within the International Bar Association and also within the uh, International Chamber of Commerce Arbitration and ADR uh, Commission where we're, we're trying to deal with the challenges of how do you how do you have an arbitration how do you have a dispute system when there's there isn't an underlying contract between the uh, people who've suffered through climate change and suffered a loss and uh, but there's there's a uh, very interesting work being done there uh, a similar sort of vein uh, debt forgiveness for example dispute resolution there um, with developing countries that are suffering from crippling debt uh, how do you resolve those disputes? Um, those are sort of new frontiers, if you like. Um, but I think the, the system itself, it has to keep uh, responding uh, to the, the criticisms. It's, it's evolved over time from a very small set of people doing something very difficult, which a lot of people didn't understand. And I think some of those prejudices have washed through into, for example, the pressure from states. Uh, now there are other ways to address these pressures through transparency, for example, and uh, that is a uh, certainly where there's a state interest. I think transparency becomes very crucial to legitimacy. Um, but equally, um, in commercial situations, it will be responsiveness to client demand that keeps it relevant. Uh, and you know, conversely, uh, in that situation, it is having a private flexible system away from the courts that, that people like. So I think it has a bright future, but certainly we have to be able to respond to these challenges uh, and, in, and in particular to, to deal properly with the, uh, the, the technology coming through and, and how that will affect things. All right. Well, I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to be quite clear that the fairness aspect has been fully dealt with and that, that still needs work. And you can see, I know you mentioned the gender equality, but it seems there's a lot of attention being put on that, rightly so. Uh, but you also mentioned the Africanization process, I think, is still requires quite a bit of work. It's, it's maybe not only that element, but quite a number of disputes that, that, that come up have involved African states. So you therefore look and wonder, well, why is it there are so few African arbitrators? Now, it, you don't appoint an arbitrator just because of, of some nationality or continent origin, uh, but, but we certainly have to make sure that there is a, there's a bigger pool of arbitrators internationally from Asia uh, and, and from Africa so that we, uh, we get a high quality, but, but from a wider catchment area and it becomes less and less of a, a, a open to the charge of being something of a club where certain people are, are, are repeat uh, arbitrators. Probably the other thing is cost. One has to keep finding ways of making sure that the costs can be as low as possible uh, while maintaining the quality. Um, I, I, I think probably they're the, uh, the main points that, uh, that, that I would like to make, fairness, fairness and, and cost. All right, thank you very much, Professor Cameron. Thank you very much, Brandon. That marks the end of our last video. 
Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned and do not forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Victoria Nowley. Uh, anything else? No. All right. Bye-bye.